Professor Hal, it is such an immense pleasure to welcome you to South Africa and even more so to academia all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you so much. Listen, the pleasure is mine. I always take away more than I give every time I come here. When it comes to um, your visits here, it's not your first time. Right. This is my ninth trip since 2008. Uh, and, you know, it was almost every other year for a while. COVID had something to say about that for a little while, but now we're back back at it. So I'm running out of things to say. I'm going to have to start making stuff up <laughs> now when they ask me to come speak. And the age-old question, what do you like most about our country, our people, and in terms of academia? Oh, well, well with respect to the people, I mean, it's an easy answer because... Uh, because we're doing ministry, I'm down here under the auspices of Ratio Christi and then Academia both, as well as uh, Apologetic South Africa, three different uh, ministries, then I have the privilege of working with God's people. So you're seeing the best of any country when you go and you have that solidarity in the Lord Jesus working in ministry. So uh, I brag on what God's doing uh, through the South Africans here in this part of the world and I get reminded how big God is and it's the same God who's who's over us all. So it's just such a great privilege for me. I always take away more than I bring, I feel like. You're a leading authority on um, Christian apologetics and philosophy. Where does your your passion for these disciplines come from? Well, I, I, you know, I wouldn't consider myself a leading authority. I'm one of many voices in the world to, trying to fight the good fight with this narrow field, someone on apologetics. But my passion grew out of the fact that I wasn't raised in a Christian home, even though I was born and reared in the part of the country that's disparagingly referred to as the Bible Belt, the, the highest concentration of conservative Protestantism in the U.S. Despite that, I wasn't raised in the church and it only came to know the Lord Jesus when I was 16 years old, but subsequently went off to university, was challenged in my faith and lost my faith intellectually. Now, I personally don't believe a person can lose their eternal life, but you can lose a lot, especially as a teenager. No offense to any teenagers watching. But uh, so it was the, the luminaries of that day. This would have been in the 70s. The luminaries and apologetics in that day, people like Norman Geisler or Josh McDowell or R.C. Sproul. And it was through their ministry that helped me reaffirm what I had believed before. But then I began to learn why I believed what I believed, how I knew that the Bible was God's word and that it was infallible or that there even was a God in the first place, those kind of things. Whatever the doubt might have been, the apologists of those days were hitting those questions for people who were seeking answers, and I benefited greatly from that. Academia's annual theology and philosophy conference just finished, and um, you were one of the speakers on the lineup. Why do you think it's important to have these scholastic um, discussions about the Christian faith and the link it has to, to the academic side of, of the discussion. You know, one of the things, one of the kind of uh, cliches that people have about academics worldwide, at least in my experience, is that it's irrelevant. You know, it's just ivory tower and it's people that are talking among themselves and it doesn't have anything to do with the real world. But of course, a lot of the things that we're fighting right now in the world with the woke, uh, the attacks on the sanctity of marriage, the attacks on the sanctity of life, all of these things were ideas that were percolating in an ivory tower generations ago. And it usually takes the trickle down to actually impact the common culture before people start realizing we've got to do something about this. So the Christians have seen this for generations, for centuries indeed, that ideas ultimately have consequences. So conferences like what academia is doing is contributing to the larger good fight around the world to fight the ideas that are so deleterious to human flourishing and are antithetical to the kingdom of God. Starts at the level of the battle over truth, and then everything else follows from that. So I'm so grateful for the academics here, uh, people like Daniel Moritz and Prof. Donnie in the uh, philosophy department that are, are uh, seeing the need for dealing with these things at a level that might strike some people as irrelevant and abstract, but they certainly have ultimate consequences in everyday life. One of the ideas behind the Philosophy and Theology Conference is to equip scholars and members of the community with ways to incorporate both academic arguments and biblical truths in responding to this um, conversation that's going on. Why is it important that you have both these um, aspects in your arsenal? So I think 
It's a first of all, with respect to the academic, or at least what's characterized often as that. I, I try to argue that that this is in in a very real sense part of God's revelation of Himself through His creation. And I think there are segments even of the Christian community that has sort of lost sight of that and has tried to relegate all we know about God just to reveal truth. Well, the problem is, I give one example, if I may. Uh, at least in America, in my lifetime, I can remember it would have been easy to say to someone, I believe the Bible is true. And they might disagree with you, but they knew what you meant when you said it was true. Now you can't even be guaranteed that they would even know what you mean when you say something is true. Oh, that's true for you. That's not true for me. So now we have to back up and sort of triage the conversation just to get some fundamentals in place in order to even get to a point where we can present the gospel. Well, a lot of those fundamentals, these sort of foundational philosophical concepts are, for better or for worse, first of all, they're philosophical, for better or for worse, and they typically are the product of, or the subject matter of the academics. That's where this sort of heavy lifting goes. But I think, as we said already, these things trickle down into the, the rest of all of us normal people, okay, where we have to live with this stuff. And it has consequences, I think, for human flourishing. So we try to connect the dots to see uh, when the time has come uh, to really, really deal with these issues uh, it, it, to the degree that we can, at least equip each other as Christians to be prepared to be able, how do we know, not only how do we know that something is true, but what do we mean when we say it's true? Or what do we mean when we say something is good? Because eventually we're going to apply these to God and say that God is truth, as Jesus said, the way, the truth, and the line. We have to be able to connect those dots for people. There are so many toxic voices, in my experience, that's flood into the conversation over the past, uh, it, less than my lifetime, it's flooded in. But there's an organization, a federal organization in the U.S. I use as an illustration called OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And what they do is regulate workplace safety in, in businesses. Now, suppose someone fell off a scaffolding and was injured in a warehouse. Then OSHA shows up, and they want to know why this guy fell. Well, it's likely the question, the answer they're looking for isn't, well, it's because of gravity. That's why he fell. Well, of course, that's why everything falls. But they're really asking a more attenuated question, why specifically did gravity prevail here? So by parallel, sometimes someone may say, well, you know, why is there so much unbelief in the world, so many false religions, so many uh, immoral things going on. And we will say, well, it's because of sin. True, that's why everything is wrong with the world. But we're really asking a more narrow question. Why does sin prevail here in this particular intellectual context? That's the thing I think the academics are trying to highlight and work with and then help translate into uh, everyday speech, if you will, to get us to understand what we can do to be part of this fighting the good fight for the kingdom of God. Do you think it's accurate to say that the Christian faith is under siege? Yes, uh, by several quarters. Uh, and, in, and, and some rise more to prominence in the news at different times. For example, recently in the U.S., we were fighting, if fighting is the right metaphor to use, this new atheism that came on the scene around 2007, 2008, that really made it culturally acceptable to be a loud atheist in the U.S., despite our history of being saturated by the Christian uh, religion. And so we were finding ourselves having to contend. Probably in the early part of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell's famous article, Why I'm Not a Christian, probably did more to disabuse university students of their faith. Then it repeated in 2007, 2008 with Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion probably took first place at disabusing young people of their faith. So you had that battle with the, uh, with the new atheists. You also have the battle at, uh, with Islam. Uh, and that's even more insidious in some respects, because unlike the new atheists, Islam, some segments of Islam will even revert to, to violence, uh, to squelch the, uh, the Christian message. So it's not even just intellectual anymore. Now it's military as far as protection. That's not my area at all. But I see that going on. And at least the intellectual is there even with Islam in terms of battling over the historical reliability of the Bible, the deity of Jesus, his resurrection from the dead, those kind of things. So there's a lot of sieges going on, and it's to be expected, I think, given that uh, you know, the, the 1 John 5 says that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 
So there's no surprise, I think, that we would be the object of such consternation in all of the elements that make up the non-Christian world. One of these elements of the siege is practicing your Christianity as a tradition. Mm-hmm. Would you agree to that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's a proliferation. And again, I, I'm basically speaking as an American in my experience, but there's such a proliferation of really, really popular churches with a thousand or more members who have no tether whatsoever to the to their Christian tradition. They don't know what the hypostatic union is, or even for that matter, the Trinity is, or what any of the sacraments or ordinances of the faith even mean and why we do this. It's funny, it's almost like a joke. In our church, our liturgical calendar just becomes the the rotation of various American holidays. So we'll have a Labor Day sermon, and we'll have a Mother's Day sermon, and then we'll have a uh, Halloween or whatever it is. And we've lost touch with some of the more traditional liturgical, uh, you know, rites of passage, if you will, as the church developed through through the years. And it's regrettable, I think. So that's a hard thing to do because now you're talking about people that at least say they love the Lord, but they don't realize how how uh, detached they are from what that has even meant for two thousand years in the church. You know, the whole idea of lip service opposed to actually rolling up your sleeves and busying yourself with the aspects of faith. When we talk about academia's um, theology and philosophy conference, you've been involved since the very first edition, which took place last year. If you reflect back on the conference, you any thoughts? Well, I tell you, something that hit me uh, again this year was how well attended it was. I'm not so sure I could get away with a conference like this in some context in the U.S., perhaps. So that was very encouraging. It, it spoke to me that there was a hunger for uh, peer review and scholar on scholar, back and forth, not only uh, maybe introducing new ideas, to, you know, hearing a paper, and I didn't know much about that, but also wrestling with ideas and trying to understand them and maybe even a little bit of pushback. Why do, you, why do you think that's true? So that's such a rich thing that goes on. We do have an equivalent to it in the U.S. that God willing, will, my wife and I, Rebecca, will be going this November, an annual meeting. So, But, yeah, it's so encouraging uh, to see that that's going on. Also, the, uh, the breadth of uh, topics that were dealt with was very encouraging. And I just sat back and was like, man, I mean, that's something I know so little about. Like Melanchthon, I heard a paper on Melanchthon and said, okay, I need to go do some homework. Maybe I should know more about Melanchthon than I probably do. I, I'm not even sure I can spell Melanchthon right now. <laughs> but it was, it was just so enriching uh, to hear that. At some stages when we popped in, the conversations and the debates got quite robust. So there was a lot of interaction. Absolutely. Um, when you reflect on last year, is that something that's also growing and evolving as it goes on? Uh, I think, you know, I'd like to think so, certainly with the fact that it seemed like there might have been even more attendees. I remember somebody commented on, uh, I think, the paper that I gave that we had a short window for the Q&A, and someone had just commented to me they wish there had been more I said, oh, well, you don't realize after we were done, standing around, drinking the coffee between and tea, the conversation was still going on, even if it wasn't under the formality of raising your hand and asking a question. There were pockets of conversation everywhere that were so rich uh, that, that it, it's like, no, don't worry. There, the conversation is going on even if it didn't come in the form of an official question during the Q&A part. What would you say are the touch points between academia as a classical Christian higher education institution, and the Southern Evangelic Seminary, yes. um, which you are a part of. Yes. So that touch point is very deep and robust. Uh, first of all, you mentioned classical. So Southern Evangelical Seminary is really the only institution I know of conservative Protestantism that's trying to really drink deeply from this classical tradition, particularly the classical philosophical tradition. Of Plato, Aristotle, finding its zenith in Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas has a bad reputation among Protestants that he doesn't deserve, in our opinion. Our co-founder was a Thomistic philosopher. So when I met uh, 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 Donnie Houston, for example, and saw that he was a Thomistic philosopher, and then his associates like Daniel Maritz, for example, uh, that I've mentioned, uh, we really had a solidarity there. In fact, Daniel 
and others and I have been Zooming for a couple of years now. We meet every Friday, read through books together, all encouraging one another in this, in this classical tradition. Um, of course, it, it, the implications for the Christian faith is more than just the philosophy. It's also the, the, the bolsters the classical theism. What we're seeing in the U.S. is the erosion of this classical notion of God, the attributes of God, omniscience, omnipotence, immutability, simplicity, these things are basically eroding. I actually do a presentation titled God Fading Away, where I document, I try to document within an hour or so, the solidarity on the attributes of God from the church fathers till yesterday, but how that's begun to fade in the past few centuries. Well, I think this classical tradition is is necessary for the sustaining of this traditional classical view. Not enough of us in the conversation, in my judgment. So that's what we're trying to do. It's almost like we're missionaries in some subset to our fellow Christian academics to woo them over to this tradition. And so, so uh, it's a growing, in the U.S. it's growing, and I'd like to think it's growing in South Africa, certainly with something like the conference here. It's, uh, it's, I'm very optimistic about the future of this classical tradition in the context of contemporary Protestantism. What excites you about the working relationship across geographical borders between institutions of higher learning? So several things jump out. One, uh, I've benefited so much from being able to do classes live streamed on the internet. And a lot of schools in the U.S. were sort of forced in that direction because of COVID. We were already doing that before COVID. All of my classes were already online before COVID even hit, so we didn't even hiccup. Yeah. Um, but that opened up opportunities of students from around the world, including a number of, in fact, we just met as a group and took a picture together of all the Southern Evangelical Seminary students that live in South Africa. So it's a badge of honor for us uh, to have uh, students interested in this, uh, this study uh, with our with our seminary, but then at, at a more uh, at a higher level, the the mutual interaction of the scholars uh, with acad- academia and Southern Evangelical Seminary, I just see more and more opportunities to the exchange of of ideas and such. It's just it's very exciting, and our staff and and support groups there in the in the states are very excited at what they see, and um, I just look forward to more of it in, into the future. And I get to come to academia. <laughs> Once in a while, I told Daniel, I said, you don't have to feel obligated to invite me every year, but as long as you do, I'm going to figure out a way to get down here. (laughs) On a lighter note in ending our conversation, you said you've been here nine times to South Africa, twice now to to academia. Have you picked up any special South African or Afrikaans lingo? So I I, I did learn how to say uh, kuyomora, you know, and buy a donkey. Uh, what I would love to learn how to say, because I've learned how to say this in several languages, is that I can't speak that language. Like, Yanie Gavadu Puduski, but I can't speak Russian. My father in law is Russian. Rebecca's dad, you know, or, you know, Sprasha Kind Deutsch, or now full of Portuguese, or whatever. I'm trying to say that I can't speak that language in that language. So maybe this trip, I'll get I'll get an Afrikaner to tell me how to, how to say I can't speak Afrikaans. That probably come in handy while I'm still trying to pick up more of the lingo. I don't think you need to master that because you're well on your way. Okay, well, thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much for chatting to me. It was very nice learning about um, the Christian apologetics. And uh, is it safe to say we'll see you again? God willing, absolutely.